the time to give your heart Come, just as you are to worship Come, just as you are before your God Come Every tongue will confess you are God One day every knee will bow Still the greatest treasure remains for those Who gladly choose you now Come, now is the time to Time to worship. Good morning. When we gather for worship, I say God is good. You say all the time. I say all the time. And you say God is good. Welcome to worship with Emmanuel Lutheran Church in North Hollywood, California. Before we begin, I invite you to download a copy of the bulletin so you'll be able to follow along with the prayers and the music. Uh, you can find that either on our website or there was a link embedded in the email announcing this worship. Also, if you haven't taken the opportunity to bring together a home altar, I invite you to do so at this time and bring together the elements needed for communion. As a little later, we'll celebrate that together as a part of our worship. I invite you to rise as you are able. We gather for worship in the same way that we live the rest of our lives. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join our voices together in our opening hymn you'll find printed in your bulletin.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And I hear you also wishing it to me. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God. We confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Jesus the Christ through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us join our voices together now in the prayer of the day. Let us pray. Glorious God, your generosity waters the world with goodness and you cover creation with abundance, awaken in us a hunger for the food that satisfies both body and spirit. And with this food, fill all the starving world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of the lessons. The lessons are not printed in your bulletin today because I've invited those who will be joining us and reading from home to choose a version of the Bible that they are most comfortable with. So I invite you as you follow along to do the same. Find whatever version of the Bible that you're most comfortable with and use it as we hear the lessons read. The first reading comes from Isaiah chapter 55, starting in verse 1. Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Why do you spend your money on that which is not bread? and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I may make you an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure love for David. See, I making a w uh, made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander to the peoples. See, you shall Call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. The second reading is from Romans 9, verses 1 through 5. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. 
they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is, over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Here ends the reading. The Gospel reading comes from Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 13. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in prayer? Thank you, God, for the blessings of this day and our gathering and the blessings of your word. Speak to our hearts and our minds and inspire us that we may follow you in all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Our gospel lesson today comes from Matthew 14 and is the feeding of the 5,000. And the feeding of the 5,000 is a story that we may have heard lots of times. So we may miss it. There are two ways that we oftentimes fail to hear the stories of Jesus and Jesus' ministry. Uh, one is that we may float past it, remembering fondly those felt boards from Sunday school when we were young and, and uh, just thinking fondly of, oh, this is a Sunday school story of Jesus doing this miraculous thing. And we leave it in that category and we don't allow it to challenge us or to speak to us in a modern context. The second thing is uh, we oftentimes in a story like this, don't allow Jesus to speak directly to us. In many other contexts, we think of ourselves as disciples. We're disciples following Jesus. In that case, what does Jesus tell us to do? Jesus says to his disciples, us, you feed them. Feeding of the 5,000 is a story. We have heard how many times, and how many times have we heard Jesus say to us, you feed them. See, the setting and context of this story is often missed, too, and that there's, uh, there's something important to put it in its place in the story of Jesus and Jesus' ministry. In chapter 14, Jesus, uh, the very first part of chapter 14 is, uh, is the story of the beheading of John the Baptist. And Jesus just hears that story. Our reading starts with, when he heard this, he withdrew to a remote place. It seems like a normal reaction that any human would have. You found out that someone you loved, someone you related to, your cousin, was killed by the king. You need time to be by yourself and time to mourn. Jesus isn't given that time. The crowds follow him. And it says really clearly 
And when Jesus saw them, he had compassion for them and he healed them. He spoke to them and cared for them and healed the sick. And when it came to the end of the day and his disciples said, isn't that enough, Jesus? Can't we just tell them to go now? After all, they're all hungry and we don't have enough to, you know, for us to eat, let alone them. So, you know, what should we do? And Jesus says, even in that place where he had to have been exhausted, he had to have been tired and emotionally wrung out. And in that place, Jesus says, you feed them. But we only have these five loaves and two fish. Well, then we'll make do. And he miraculously feeds a great crowd. Another thing that gets in the way of our reading of scripture and oftentimes is pushback against uh, biblical preaching. I have to say that this is a this is a pitfall and something that I've experienced in my ministry. And I heard this week, especially uh, a lot of my colleagues talking about. That when you preach the message of the Bible, when you preach scripture. There will be always people who hear it as nothing but political rhetoric. They'll hear it and say, you shouldn't be preaching about politics. Clearly, I believe in my heart of hearts that someone who would say that has never read their Bible. And it's surprising how much the Bible really actually isn't, isn't entirely about politics. It addresses politics. But as people of faith, the Bible speaks to us about the things that are political realities in our world. And so... We're obligated to take those things seriously and to hear them in the way that Jesus speaks to his followers and speaks to us. The um, great example of the Bible speaking into the reality of the world was uh, an example of that pushback about, well, don't, don't preach politically. Many of my colleagues and myself included. On the Sunday following the election in 2016. The assigned lectionary reading from the Revised Common Lectionary, which Protestants and Catholics have been using for decades to guide the readings for Sunday morning. The gospel reading for that Sunday was the Beatitudes from Matthew. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, etc., etc. And because that the rancor and rhetoric of the election had been so rough and so drastic and so dramatic. Many people heard pastors, well, you pick that text because, because of what it says about the poor and the grieving and the foreigner and the widow. Caring for others? No, I didn't pick it for that. It says that. And it happened to be the assigned reading for the day. But... There are always those who will hear the word from scripture, the direction of how to be a Jesus follower as being nothing but political rhetoric. It's not. And sadly, those who hear it that way and choose to dismiss what they don't like to hear from the Bible as just political preaching is really us making God in our own image. And it's not us allowing God to remake us in God's image. The Bible speaks of loving our neighbor and loving your enemies. If God meant just love those who look, act, and think like you, God probably would have just said that. But instead, God said, love your neighbor. Love your enemies. Our faith and the Bible that guides that faith has very dramatic things to say about racism and justice in this time that we live in. And yet, our inclination is to, is to find the things in the Bible that speak to the things we want and to justify the way we want to be in the world. That's remaking God in our own image. Over the years, I've read several books, and I have books in my library that address this exact thing. Here are four of them. First, a book by John Meacham called The American Gospel. Uh, 
this is a book that has that many footnotes. This part right here, all footnotes. And it's very well researched about the way in which Christianity has been appropriated in an American context. Second one is called Imaginary Jesus by Matt uh, Michelados. Third one is An American Gospel by Eric Reese. And finally, Lamb by Christopher Moore. Now, a couple of these are humorous. They're satirical. In fact, uh, the sub subtitle for Lamb is Lamb, the Gospel According to Biff, Christ's Childhood Friend. But what all of these books together and many more like them have in common is they address the reality that many times Christians have appropriated the parts of their faith and the parts of the Bible that gratify what we want and make our faith be about saying and doing the things that we want to say and do as opposed to the things that God wants us to say and do. To be people of faith, to be followers of the way, those who believe the Bible is the word of God means we take the whole Bible and understand that it doesn't say what we want it to say. It says what God wants it to say. And our job is to listen to what God has to say, be changed by it, and grow into what God wants us to be. <sighs> Love your neighbor as yourself is not a political statement but it should inform our consideration of Black Lives Matter. Care for the dying and the healing the sick is not a political statement, but it should inform our consideration of insurance and medical care, and Medicare specifically. Care for the stranger, the widow, the orphan, the foreigner among you. These words sound familiar? They're not political speech. They're not a political statement, but they should inform our consideration of border security and foreign policy. Feeding of those who are in need, like the story from Matthew 14, is not a political statement. But it should inform our consideration of things like food stamps. We are called to care for those in need. And we are called to care for our neighbor, not just those who look and act and think like we do, all of our neighbors. So in this time where we're being pushed and pulled and challenged on so many fronts, rather than be defensive, dig in our heels, we need to be the ones as the church, as the faithful followers of Jesus, who engaged with the rich and the poor alike, took no favorites and no sides. But if he took any side, it'd be against those who were leading the church as an oppressive institution that was in bed with the empire. Now, in this time, as we hear rhetoric about, about race, about capitalism, about white supremacy, may we open our hearts and our ears to listen to what God is saying to us and what God is doing in the world around us. When Jesus was on the hillside in that remote place so many years ago, he didn't say to the disciples, have the people sit down and then in an orderly fashion, come up, explain their livelihood, their income level, and then we'll decide whether or not to feed them. He said, you feed them. We've really not had too much pushback and reconsideration of whether or not we ought to feed people or care for the hungry or love our neighbors. We've always believed those things. Have we always done it? Haven't we always also fought over who gets it, who gets to do it, who's worthy, those sorts of things. But the commission of Jesus is you feed them. Well, in that time, on that hillside, in that place so long ago, the disciples said, but we only have this, it's a little amount. We don't have hardly anything. And Jesus says, it'll be enough. In this time, in this place, it may feel like because of the quarantine and all the realities of the world, but we only have this. 
Dear church, it is enough. Here's an example. You all have one of these. Is it enough? Can you use your phone to reach out, to speak to those in need? Those who need to hear a word of encouragement, a word of love? Yeah. And that, that's the five loaves. That's the the small meager amount that Jesus has with us in this time. If nothing else, we have that. We may think that in this time of needing to be separated and distanced and in this time of not being able to gather and worship in person, that we don't have much, but we do. And what we, what little we have and know we have, God can use to change the world, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, comfort the grieving, free the oppressed. Brothers and sisters, this is our call. This is what we are called to do as followers of Jesus. This week, in your walk of faith, you may only be walking around your neighborhood. Granted, that's okay. But in that, and in what you do, and what you take in as news, and what you put back out in the world in communication, whether it's on Facebook or anything else, you can use that little bit to put light into the world in the face of such great darkness. This week, and we use the few loaves that we've been given to feed those in need. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to rise as you are able and remain standing for the hymn, the creed, the prayers, and the words of institution.
us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again and is ascended into heaven. He is seated on the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident of, our, of your care and help by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. You take resources that appear to be meager, bless them, and there is enough. May your church trust that what you bless and ask us to share with the world is abundantly sufficient. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your bountiful creation offers sustenance and life for all creatures. Protect this abundance for the well-being of all. Reverse the damage we have caused your creation and we especially pray for the Pacific Ocean. Replenish groundwater supplies, provide needed rains in places of drought, and protect forests from wildfires. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You offer yourself to all the nations and the peoples of the earth, inviting everyone to abundant life. Bring the prophetic vision to fullness that all nations will run to you, and the nations who do not know you will find their joy in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every loving thing. Hear the anguish of tender hearts who cry to you in suffering and satisfy their deepest needs. Bring wholeness and healing to those who suffer in body, heart, soul, and mind. We especially pray for those suffering from the COVID-19 virus and those who are suffering from fear because of the virus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You offer freely the fullness of salvation. Give your congregation, Emanuel Lutheran Church, such a welcoming heart that our words and actions may extend your free and abundant hospitality to all whom we encounter. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You gather your saints as one, united in the body of Jesus. Bring us with all your saints to the heavenly banquet. We remember with love and thanksgiving the saints that we have known, those who have gone on before us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. During this time of social distancing, it's not wise for us to meet in person for worship. But even in this time, it's important for us to be purposeful about our stewardship and our giving. So I invite you to be purposeful with your offerings. You may mail your offerings to the church office, or you may give online on our website, or with a mobile device. There's a link embedded in the email announcing this worship and in the bulletin for all of the things that we offer for God's service. Let us pray together. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water the, and word, wine and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, the night that he was betrayed by one of his closest friends, by one of his disciples, he gathered in the upper room for the Passover celebration with all of his disciples. And while they're at the table eating, Jesus took bread and wine and made them into something new. While they were at the table eating, Jesus took bread he blessed it, he broke it,
and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. When you gather together, do this and remember me. When they were done eating, he took the cup. He blessed the wine. He gave thanks to his Father in heaven, and he gave it to them. And said, this, is, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. When you gather together, do this and remember me. So as often as we share this meal together, we remember. Now together, let us remember the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen table is set, the meal is ready, and all are welcome at the Lord's table. As you share communion amongst yourselves, I invite you to proclaim to one another that this is the body of Christ given for you, and this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. This is the Please rise. Let us pray. God of the welcome table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth sustained by these gifts so that we may share your neighborly love with all through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life. Amen. As we go out from here, may God go with us. May God go ahead of us on our path to show us the way. May God go behind us to encourage us, above us to protect us, 
beside us as our companion and within us to show us his love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us join our voices together in our sending hymn you'll find printed in your bulletin. Go in peace, take good care of yourselves and one another, and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>